Hey guys, this is Mark Goldberg from Mark Vlogs Watches, and naturally we have another exciting episode for you today, and we are going to talk about how Rolex plans to basically edge Patek out of the highest end of the luxury watch market in terms of a commonly available and well-known brand. But before we get into the mashed potatoes of this particular video, let's go ahead and get the quick fist watch check out of the way. You know it's coming, and here it is. Today, guys, I am wearing a Rolex Yachtmaster with a platinum bezel and a beautiful sunburst blue dial. Now, uh, because this watch is really hard to photograph under sort of like cloudy skies the way we have today, I'm going to quick drop a picture of it in right here so that you can get a look at the dial. Take a look. I have so much more I'd like to share with you. Please subscribe to my channel and throw a like on this video. Guys. What do I mean by Rolex is trying to edge out Patek? Okay, first let's, let's talk about the differences between the two brands and then we'll talk about what I think is happening here uh, because th the strategy of Rolex, I believe, is firmly behind the long-lasting Rolex steel sports shortage and I think that that's going to get nothing but worse and so what you're hearing here are my theories as to why so as we go along here I would appreciate it if you throw in your thoughts your reactions in the comments and what you think may be going on as well first Patek is a family-owned company and Rolex is a foundation it, Rolex is an independent company not owned by a family not publicly owned it is in fact owned by a charitable foundation because that's how its founder Hans Vilsdorf originally left it. He left it in trust to a charitable foundation. And so Rolex, unlike most companies, is not beholden to its shareholders, but rather to its board of directors. And I believe that what that means is that Rolex can take a much longer view of its overall marketing and pricing and long-range sales strategies than, let's say, a Richemont, which is a publicly held company or group of companies. And uh, those guys have uh, shareholders that they're responsible to. And even Patek is answerable to its own family uh, ownership. And if those guys ever want to sell Patek, they're going to have to run the numbers up, make the books look good in order to get the maximum amount of money for the sale of the company. And in fact, there are rumors that one of these days, Patek will be sold. Rolex never going to be sold. It's a perpetually ongoing charitable trust. Uh, and, under the, and, and incorporated under the laws of Switzerland, which means they don't have to tell anybody anything. It is a very secretive society, uh, the financials over there in Switzerland. You know, a charitable trust in the United States, I'm not saying it's better, it's just very different. Um, for those of you who may not know the difference, the United States has very specific laws about publicly revealing information in terms of where the money is going um, to receive tax exempt status. So if you're a charitable trust in the United States, there's a lot of information that you have to reveal, financial and otherwise, in order to maintain your tax free status. Apparently that is not the case in Switzerland. Okay, so Rolex. Now they have never released how many watches it is that they make in a year. But um, hey guys, I think that we would all agree that the commonly held number that we hear is 1 million. So apparently the Rolex is making, uh, cranking out a million watches per year. And does that really make it a luxury brand? Actually, some of my inside sources have stipulated that the, the number might be closer to 800,000 than 1 million. But still, let's call it, let's round it up in the, when we're talking about these kind of numbers. And let's just agree for the moment that Rolex is making 1 million of these puppies per year. There's no way you're going to mass produce a million of anything without having a highly mechanized process to do so. So basically, I think that Rolex can thank Henry Ford, you know, who invented the assembly line, uh, for the whole concept of being able to make this many watches. Now, I'm not disparaging Rolex's manufacturing process. In fact, I think it's a, it's a modern miracle of investment, foresight, engineering, technology. And the reason for that is you don't have people on a line passing it down one guy puts on the second hand passes it down another guy puts on the minute hand passes it down that is how the model t's were made but definitely that's not how rolex is getting made um rolex is highly mechanized this stuff is uh touched by a human hand but i think out of all the time that it is in production if we were to count 
the number of minutes or seconds that it's being touched by a human hand. It would be a very, very small percentage. Compare that to something like Patek, where there is a lot of hand work, hand assembly of the movement, hand casing. Like this, we know there's a lot of hand movement in or hand work in a Patek versus much less in a Rolex, but we'll get back to Patek in a minute. So Rolex highly mechanized, polished by machine, manufactured by machine. I don't know how it's cased. I know that people do eventually touch it, but let's just say it takes um, mostly machine work. Do I think that that's a bad thing? And do I think that that yields a bad watch? No, I think it's brilliant. Listen, uh, what the Rolex uh, board of directors has done is to invest untold millions upon millions upon millions, just they've probably got a billion dollars in robots, machinery, equipment, plants, manufacturing. Remember, Rolex has decided that they want to control every single element of the watchmaking process. Now, they don't own their own diamond mines, but they do grade and sort. Uh, and as far as I know, cut all their own diamonds and all their gemstones for the, the precious metal guys that have, uh, you know, diamonds and gems in them. So they're grading, sorting, buying uh, diamonds, rubies, gems, all, you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, the first thing. They smelt their own gold. I mean, this, they have their own foundry for gold. They mix their own gold. So their white gold, their rose gold, their yellow gold, all of that is done by Rolex. They have their own proprietary formulas for making that uh, rose gold look like Rolex rose gold, rose gold doesn't look anything like anybody else's. And in fact, their white gold uh, is also a little bit different. Um, in the watch world, most white gold is rhodium plated, um, except for it is not so on Rolex. Rolex, it is gold like throughout. So if you scratch it, you don't have to replate the watch if you scratch a white gold Rolex. But I digress. They even smelt their own steel. Now, Rolex has been one of the few, if maybe the only manufacturer making watches out of 904L steel. This is a different grade of stainless steel than is used in most watches, or I should say in most brands. And uh, most of them are in 316 steel. 904L steel is reputed to hold a shine better. And I think, you know, when you, when you look at Rolex, it's matte finish tends to glow. It's a high polish center link kind of finish tends to really shine. Um, it's not more scratch proof, guys. It just is more corrosion resistant and reputedly holds a polish and shine better. And I do believe that because there's just something gorgeous about the, the matte finish and the high polish finish of a Rolex. Now, some of that is going to be their mechanized processing in terms of how they do it, all proprietary. Some of it's going to be the raw material that they're working with, which is 904L. By the way, as a, as a quick aside, Ball Watch has just recently released, it's in pre-production now, their first watch in 904L steel. So this particular material that the, this Yacht Master is made of is no longer a Rolex only thing. In fact, going to Ball, which is, I don't know, is, is Ball a luxury watch? Maybe at the very, very beginning of the stepladder. Okay. So Rolex, I guess what I'm trying to say here is they mass market and mass merchandise and mass fabricate their watches, but they put an unbelievable level of care and quality into them. Now, I know, like my friend Guy over at Bluefish Watches, he found a, a burr under the um, crystal of his brand new Submariner and it had to go to the Rolex Service Center for repair. Um, and if you go um, online in the forums, you'll find any number of guys posting like super blow up pictures where there's like some little issue or problem with a Rolex, um, you know, right new out of the factory. So I, I know that does happen and it certainly it's going to happen more than if somebody was going over each, you know, watch with a loop for an hour before it goes out the door. And that's not Rolex. Um, but uh, I, I think that the, the relative instance of quality control problems in the brand is relatively low. I don't know what the percentage is, but I, I bet it's not higher than 1%. Now in Patek, it's going to be a quarter of a percent because those guys are going over that thing with a loop. So switching, switching topics for a second, let's flip over to the concept of Patek. Again, you know, it's family owned, so they don't release precise numbers, but the well-worn number that everybody throws around that Patek makes is 50,000 watches per year. So we've got a guy making 50,000 watches with a lot of handwork, and we have a charitable foundation making 800 to a million, 800,000 to a million watches per year, and they're flying off, you know, of, a, um, of an assembly line. There, guys, there's a lot more horology or, and horological value in a Patek, okay? These things are just more beautiful on the micro 
and macro level, to quote my friend Bruce Williams. You, you would go in on, a, on the macro level on, uh, on, on the movement of a Rolex, you would see a very plain Jane workhorse type movement. But if you zoom in really close on a Patek movement, you're going to be looking at mechanized artwork. No other way to look at it. If Rolex is artistic, it is just due to the fact that how many they can make and uh, the fact that they work so well. And Rolex is deadly accurate, guys. I mean, I'm not dissing the brand. I love me a Rolex. They're accurate to plus minus two seconds per day now. That's a superlative chronometer. That's extraordinary. So there's just a ton of design and engineering that goes into a Rolex these days. And I think we have to applaud that. But we also have to recognize they are no Patek Philippe, okay? The Patek Philippe watches are more exclusive, they are harder to get, and they are far more expensive. Well, they are far more expensive at MSRP. When you start looking onto the resale market, you know, you could pay um, more on the resale market for a ceramic Daytona than you would for a Calatrava, uh, uh, new from Patek. From Patek. You go into a Patek authorized dealer and they want to know who you are. They don't just sell to anybody. Do you have any other Patek, sir? Have you been with the brand long? You, you know, I think they come close to wanting you to open up a vein and give a small blood sample, a, a cheek swab, so they can check your DNA and make certain that you are qualified to earn a Patek Philippe, monsieur. Um, I do think it's a little bit like that. Um, so Rolex, you know, they have a different marketing perspective. Rolex, by the way, I made a whole video on this. They spend over a hundred million dollars or almost a hundred million dollars per year advertising and marketing the brand. So in any 10 year period, Rolex is spending approximately one billion dollars to sell you these watches. So naturally, you know, people want them. Um, Patek Philippe, they make very few of them. So they want to know who you are before they will sell you one. Rolex, hmm. They don't, they don't care to the same degree who you are, but they have a grand strategy in mind. And here's, I'm getting to the point here. In fact, this, this point I have made earlier, and I think it's such a strong point that uh, if you follow um, Paul Thorpe, you'll notice that he made a video saying after me, by the way, about two, three weeks after me, the exact same thing that I'm about to say now. Rolex is shooting for Patek level pricing, and Rolex is shooting for Patek level exclusivity but they're doing so by virtue of their mechanized excellence. So twice the price of what we have now. Right now, listen guys, it's half the price, almost about half the price of a Patek Philippe, but it's also got half the horology. What if it costs just as much as a Patek Philippe, but it had one half the horology on board? That's what's happening. How is Rolex doing that? By cranking up the marketing animal and reducing the supply. Now, this is causing a great deal of disruption in the marketplace amongst collectors, because what it means is we cannot waltz into the authorized dealer and just buy that Hulk, or buy that Daytona, or buy that Bluesy. Actually, the Bluesy is probably easier to get than all of them. Why would that be? Ah, well, real quick, I'm going to kind of vomit out the last bit of what I think the Rolex strategy is. This business where you see these watches going for so much more on the secondary market, I believe it's somewhat temporary. Does that mean that prices are going to fall on the secondary market, that the bubble will burst? Nah, -uh. no. What it means is Rolex will be working their price up until they close the gap between MSRP and secondary market. I don't think Rolex hates the secondary market nearly as much as you think. I think they're studying it, engaging it, and they're saying, hmm, there's a pretty good demand for these Daytonas in steel at uh, $20,000. Why are we selling them for 12? And I think what you will see is there's a long-term strategy. I don't think they're just going to bam, do it all at once uh, because these are very measured, slow, very deliberate people. This is Swiss marketing, Swiss economics, Swiss manufacturing, Swiss level secrecy. Rolex changes by millimeters, not even by inches. So I think what we're looking at is a long-term strategy. And uh, guys, if you shoot ahead 25 years, the gray market, I think it's severely damaged because whatever the gray market would be selling these watches for, that's going to be MSRP. Now, does Rolex begin to then open the spigot to starve out gray market? Time will tell. I'm not really sure. But I can tell you this. If you have the option to purchase a stainless steel Rolex, whether you get it from the authorized dealer or on the gray market, and you are able to do so at close to retail pricing, you, you should do it. You should do it. There are very few stainless steel watches from Rolex that are still available 
on the secondary market below MSRP, the Yachtmaster is one of them, Yachtmaster 2. It's one of those watches and there's very few left. You know, I made videos two, three years ago heavily suggesting that you people go to the um, secondary market to buy your Rolex because you would save a bunch of money over retail. And guys, those days are long gone. You should make friends with an authorized dealer is what you should do now because they are the heroes of this story, okay? They are the people who have access and can grant you access if you, if you meet their criteria. And what their criteria, by and large, and now I'm talking about the good, honest, decent, authorized dealers, and there's tons of those, what they are really trying to avoid is selling to flippers. Yeah, now I know there are some unscrupulous ADs who are, sell, who are flipping them themselves. I'm sure that happens. But I believe also that the vast majority of these family-owned jewelry stores who really depend on their Rolex authorized dealership, I mean, it's a contract that allows them to distribute the product. It's their claim to fame. They're being very careful. And uh, they want to sell to people that they have good reason to believe are going to hold those watches, keep those watches, and not flip them. Because if you flip them and it comes back to Rolex, well, that that is... Um, a black mark on the name of the authorized dealer who sold that flipped watch. And if an AD sells enough flipped watches, they could be jeopardizing their authorized dealer contract and then, you know, they're stuck selling only uh, Breitling, you, you know, and uh, Tag Heuer. And uh, no, no jewelry store who's serious about watches wants that. Guys, thanks for having, you know, been bearing with me through all of this. I guess the end of the story is I think that the supply of steel is not going to get any better. I think steel, even in date just, is going to get more difficult. What you are going to see instead is more and more of, uh, can you hear the geese? There's like this big flock of geese going over. Uh, you, what you're going to hear is more, see, you'll see more and more two-tone watches and, uh, you know, a slightly easier supply maybe of some of the precious metal. But steel is just going to get hard to get. And I think that the strategy that Rolex has been applying to steel sports is going to very quickly and soon be applied to steel date justs and then eventually even two-tone date justs. Guys, <laughs> geese, this bubble isn't going to burst. It's going to intensify. The shortage is going to get worse. Prices are going to go higher, particularly on the gray market. But watch Rolex start slowly catching up to the gray market. What do you guys think about this? Please join me. Uh, I've got lots more thoughts, opinions, and information to share with you, so subscribe to my channel. Let's do this again. Tell me in the comments, what do you think about all this? This is Goldberg with Steel Sports Rolex. You better get one while you can, guys. Peace out. Mm -hmm.